Part 10 of Time Crime by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Time Crime Part 10 On police terminal, he found Kostran Goth, the agent who had been selected to impersonate Sal Goth Trod. After calling Zulthran Torv, the mathematician in charge of the computer office, and giving him the Eseron timeline designations and Nentrov Dard's ideas about them, he spent about an hour briefing Kostran Golf on the role he was to play. Finally, he undressed and went to bed on a couch in the restroom behind the office. It was noon when he woke. After showering, shaving, and dressing hastily, he went out to the desk for breakfast which arrived while he was putting a call through to Ranthar Jard at Narcan equivalent. "'Your idea paid off, chief's assistant,' the Kolgur Sekreg sub-chief told him. "'The slaves gave us a lot of physical description data on the estate, and told us about new fields that had been cleared, and a dam this Lord Gromdor was building to flood some new rice paddies. We located a belt of about five peri years where these improvements had been made.' We started boomeranging the whole belt, timeline by timeline. So far we have ten or fifteen pictures of the main square at Soram showing Krautha with firearms, and pictures of wizard trader camps and conveyor heads on the same timelines. Here, let me show you. This is from an airboat over the forest outside the equivalent of Soram. There was no jungle visible when the view changed nothing but clusters of steel towers and platforms and buildings that marked conveyor heads, and a large rectangle of red and white anti-grav buoys moored to warn air traffic out of the area being boomeranged. The pickup seemed to be pointed downward from the bow of an airboat circling at about ten thousand feet. "'Ball's ready to go,' a voice called, and then repeated a string of timeline designations. Estimated return, 1820, give or take four minutes. Varth, Ranthar Jard said, evidently out of the boat's radio, your telecast is being beamed on Durgarbar equivalent. Chief's assistant Verkan is watching. When do you estimate your next return? Any moment now, sir. We're holding this drop till they rematerialize. Vol watched unblinkingly, his fork poised halfway to his mouth. Suddenly, about a thousand feet below the eye of the pickup, there was a series of blue flashes, and an instant later, a blossoming of red and white parachutes, ejected from the photo reconnaissance balls that had returned from the Kolgor sector. All right, drop away, the boat captain called. There was a gush from underneath of eight inch spheres, their conductor mesh twinkling golden bright in the sunlight. They dropped in a tight cluster for a thousand feet or so, and then flashed and vanished. From the ground, six or eight air cars rose to meet the descending parachutes and catch them. The screen went cubist for a moment, and then Ranthar jarred swarthy, wide-jawed face looked out of it again. He took his pipe from his mouth. "'We'll probably get a positive out of the batch you just saw coming in,' he said. We get one out of about every two drops. Message a list of the timeline designations you've gotten so far to Zulthran Torv at computer office here, Vol said. He's working on the Esron sector dope. We think a pattern can be established. I'll be seeing you in about five hours. I'm rocketing out of here as soon as I get a few more things cleared up here. Zoltan Torv, normally cautious to the degree of pessimism, was jubilant when Val called him. "'We have something, Val,' he said. "'It is, roughly, what Dr. Nentroff suggested. Each of the intervals between the designations is a very minute but very exact fraction of the difference between lesser designation and baseline designation.' "'You have the baseline designation?' Val demanded. "'Oh, yes. That's what I was telling you.' We worked that out from the designations you gave us. He recited it. All the designations you gave me are... Vol wasn't listening to him. He frowned in puzzlement. That's not a fifth-level designation, he said. That's first level. That's correct. First-level Abzar sector. 
Now why in blazes didn't anybody think of that before? He marveled, and as he did, he knew the answer. Nobody ever thought of the Abzar sector. Twelve millennia ago, the world of the first level had been exhausted. Having used up the resources of their home planet, Mars, a hundred thousand years before, the descendants of the population that had migrated across space had repeated on the third planet the devastation of the fourth. The ancestors of Verkan Vall's people had discovered the principle of paratime transposition, and had begun to exploit an infinity of worlds on other lines of probability. The people of the first level Dwarma sector, reduced by sheer starvation to a tiny handful, had abandoned their cities and renounced their technologies, and created for themselves a farm and village culture without progress or change or curiosity or struggle or ambition, and a way of life in which every day was like every other day that had been or that would come. The Abzar people had done neither. They had wasted their resources to the last, fighting bitterly over the ultimate crumbs, with fission bombs, and with muskets, and with swords, and with spears and clubs. And finally they had died out, leaving a planet of almost uniform desert dotted with vast empty cities, which even twelve thousand years had hardly begun to obliterate. So nobody on the Paratime Sector went to the Abzar Sector. There was nothing there except a hiding place. Well, message that to Subchief Ranthar Jard, Kolgur Sector, at Narcan Equivalent, and to Subchief Volthor, Esseron Sector, Novalan Equivalent, Val said. And be sure to mark what you send Volthor, immediate attention, Deputy Subchief Skordran. That reminded him of something. As soon as he was through with Zolthran, he got out an order in the name of Tortha Karf authorizing Skordran Curve's promotion on a permanent basis and messaged it out. Something was going to have to be done with Valthor Tharn, too. A promotion, of course. Say, Deputy Bureau Chief, hypno Tape Library at Durgabar Home Timeline. There, Valthor's passion for procedure and his caution would be assets instead of liabilities. He called Vlasthor Arf, the chief's deputy assigned to him as adjutant. "'I want more troops from Servsec and Insec, he said. "'Go over the T.O.s and see what can be spared from where. Don't strip any timeline, but get a force of the order of about three divisions. And locate all the big anti-grav-equipped ship transposition docks on commercial and passenger sectors, and a list of freighters and passenger ships that can be commandeered in a hurry. We think we've spotted the timeline the organization's using as a base. As soon as we raid a couple of places near Narcan and Novaland equivalents, we're going to move in for a planet-wide cleanup. I get it, Chief's Assistant. I do everything I can to get ready for a big move without letting anything leak out. After you strike the first blow, there won't be any security problem and the lid will be off. In the meantime, I make up a general plan and alert all our own people, right? Right. And for your information, the base isn't fifth level. It's first level Abzar. He gave the designation. Vlasthor Arf chuckled. Well, think of that. I'd even forgotten there was an Abzar sector. Shall I tell the reporters that? Fangs of Fasif, no! Val fairly howled. Then, curiously, what reporters? How did they get onto Paul term? About fifty or sixty new service people Chief Tortha sent down here this morning, with orders to prevent them from filing any stories from here but to let them cover the raids when they come off. We were instructed to furnish them weapons and audiovisual equipment and vocal riders and anything else they needed, and... Vol grinned. That was one I'd never thought of he admitted. The old fox is still the old fox. No, tell them nothing. We'll just take them along and show them. Oh, and where are Dr. Hadron Dalla and that girl of Salgath Trods? They're sleeping now. Rest room 18. Dalla and Zingana were asleep on a big mound of silk cushions in one corner. 
their glossy black heads close together and Zingana's brown arm around Dalla's white shoulder. Their faces were calmly beautiful in repose, and they smiled slightly, as though they were wandering through a happy dream. For a little while Val stood looking at them, then he began whistling softly. On the third or fourth bar Dalla woke and sat up, waking Zingana, and blinked at him perplexedly. "'What time is it?' she asked. "'About twelve forty-five, he told her. "'Oh, we just got to sleep,' she said. "'We're both bushed.' "'You had a hard time. "'Feel all right after your narco-hip, Zingana?' "'It wasn't so bad, and I had a nice sleep. "'And Dalla, Dr. Hadron, I mean. "'Dalla,' Val's wife corrected. "'Remember what I told you?' "'Dalla, then.' Zingana smiled. Dalla gave me some hypno-treatment, too. I don't feel so badly about Trod any more. Well, look, Zingana, we're going to have a man impersonate Councilman Salgoth on a telecast. The cosmeticians are making him over now. Would you find it too painful to meet him and talk to him? No, I wouldn't mind. I can criticize the impersonation. Remember, I knew Trod very well. You know, I was his hostess, too. I met many of the people with whom he was associated, and they know me. Would things look more convincing if I appeared on the telecast with your man? It certainly would. It would be a great help, he told her enthusiastically. Maybe you girls ought to get up now. The telecast isn't until 1930, but there's a lot to be done getting ready. Dolly yawned. What I get trying to be a cop, she said, then caught the other girl's hand and rose, pulling her up. Come on, Zina, we have to get to work. Val rose from behind the reading screen in Ranthar Jard's office, stretching his arms over his head. For almost an hour he sat there pushing buttons and twiddling selector and magnification adjustment knobs looking at the pictures the Colgore Narcan cops had taken with auto-return balls dropped over the spatial equivalent of Soram. One set of pictures, taken at 2,000 feet, showed the central square of the city. The effects of the Krauthus sack were plainly visible. So were the captives herded together under guard like cattle. By increasing magnification, he looked at groups of the barbarian conquerors, big men with blonde or reddish-brown hair, in loose shirts and baggy trousers and rough cowhide buskins. Many of them wore bowl-shaped helmets. Some had shirts of ring mail. All of them carried long straight swords with cross hilts. And about half of them had pistols thrust through their belts or muskets slung from their shoulders. The other set of pictures showed the wizard trader camps and conveyor heads. In each case, a wide oval had been burned out in the jungle, probably with heavy-duty heat guns. The camps were surrounded with stout wire-mesh fence. In each there were a number of metal prefab huts and an inner-fenced slave pen. A trail had been cut from each to a similarly cleared circle farther back in the forest, and in the centers of one or two of these circles he saw the actual conveyor domes. There was a great deal of activity in all of them, and he screwed the magnification adjustment to the limit to scrutinize each human figure in turn. A few of the men, he was sure, were first-level citizens. More were either proles or outtimers. Quite a few of them were of a dark, heavy-featured, black-bearded type. Some of these fellows look like second-level Kiftons, he said. Rush an individual picture of each one, maximum magnification consistent with clarity, to Durgabar equivalent to be transposed to home timeline. You get all the dope from Zoltran Torv? Yes. Abzar Sector, Ranthar Jard said. I'd never have thought of that. Wonder why they use that Siri system, though. I'd have tried to spot my operations as completely at random as possible. Only thing they could have done, Val said. When we get hold of one of their conveyors, we're going to find the control panels just a mess of arbitrary symbols, 
and there'll be something like a computer machine built into the control cabinet to select the right timeline whenever a dial set or a button pushed, and the only way that could be done would be by establishing some kind of a numerical series. And we were trustingly expecting to locate their base from one of their conveyors. Why, if we give all those people in the pictures narco-hips, we won't learn the baseline designation. None of them will know it. They just go where the conveyors take them. Well, we're all set now, Ranthar Jard said. I have a plan of attack worked out, subject to your approval. I'm ready to start implementing it now. He glanced at his watch. The Salgath telecast is over on home timeline, and in a little while a transcript will be on this timeline. Want to watch it here, sir? The telecast screen in the living room of Tortha Karf's town apartment was still on. In it, a girl with bright red hair danced slowly to soft music against a background of shifting color. The four men who sat in a semicircle facing it sipped their drinks and watched idly. Ought to be getting some sort of public reaction soon, Tortha Karf said, glancing at his watch. Well, I'll have to admit it was done convincingly. Zosta Olv, the chief interoffice coordinator, admitted grudgingly. I'd have believed it if I hadn't known the real facts. Shooting it against the background of those wide windows was smart, Lovranth Roke said. Every schoolchild would recognize that view of the rocket port as being on police terminal. And including that girls in Ghana, that was a real masterpiece. I've met her a few times. Elbraz Vark, the political liaison assistant, said. Isn't she lovely? Good actress, too, Tortha Karf said. It's not easy to impersonate yourself. Well, Kostra and Galth did a fine job of acting, too, Lovranth Roke said. That was done to perfection. The distinguished politician, supported by his loyal mistress, bravely facing the disgraceful end of his public career. You know, I believe I could get that girl a booking with one of the big theatrical companies. Now that Salgoth's dead, she'll need somebody to look after her. What sharp furry ears you have, Mr. Elbraz, Zosta Ulf grunted. The music stopped as though cut off with a knife, and the slim girl with the red hair vanished in a shatter of many colors. When the screen cleared, one of the announcers was looking out of it. We interrupt the program for an important newscast of a sensational development in the Salgath affair, he said. Your next speaker will be Yandar Yad. I thought you'd managed to get that blabbermouth transposed to Paul term, Zosta said. He wouldn't go, Tortha Karf replied. Said it was just a trick to get him off home timeline during the council crisis. Yandar Yad had appeared on the screen as the pickup swung about. Recording ostensibly made by Councilman Salgath on police terminal timeline and telecast on home timeline an hour ago. Well, I don't know who he was, but I now have positive proof that he definitely was not Salgath Trod. We're sunk, Zos the Alv grunted. He'd never make a statement like that unless he could prove it. Something suspicious about the whole thing from the beginning, the newsman was saying. So I checked. If you recall, the actor impersonating Salgath gestured rather freely with his hands, in imitation of a well-known mannerism of the real Salgath trod. At one point, the ball of his right thumb was presented directly to the pickup. Here's a still of that scene. He stepped aside, revealing a view screen behind him. When he pressed a button, the screen lighted. On it was a stationary picture of Kostran Golf as Salgath Trod, his right hand raised in front of him. Now, watch this. I'm going to step up the magnification, slowly, so that you can be sure there's no substitution. Camera, a little closer, Trath. The screen in the background seemed to advance, until it filled the entire screen. Yandar Yad was still talking, out of the picture. A metal-tipped pointer came into the picture, touching the right thumb, which grew larger and larger until it was the only thing visible. 
Now here, Yandar Yad's voice continued, any of you who are familiar with the ancient science of dactyloscopy will recognize this thumb as having the ridge pattern known as a twin loop. Even with the high degree of magnification possible with the microgrid screen, we can't bring out the individual ridges, but the pattern is unmistakable. I ask you to memorize that image, while I show you another right thumbprint, this time a certified photocopy of the thumbprint of the real Salgath trod. The magnification was reduced a little. A card was moved into the picture, and it was stepped up again. See, this thumbprint is of the type known as a tented arch. Observe the difference. That does it, Zosta Alf cried. Karf, for the first and last time, let me remind you that I oppose this lunacy from the beginning. Now what are we going to do next? I suggest that we get to headquarters as soon as we can. Torthakarf said. If we wait too long, we may not be able to get in. Yandar Yad was back on the screen, denouncing Tortha Karf passionately. Tortha went over and snapped it off. I suggest we transpose to Paul term, Lovranth Roke said. It won't be so easy for them to serve a summons on us there. You can go to Paul term if you want to, Tortha Karf retorted. I'm going to stay here and fight back, and if they try to serve me with a summons, they'd better send a robot for a process server. Fight back? Zos the Alv echoed. You can't fight the council and the whole management. They'll tear you into inch bits. I can hold them off till Val's able to raid those Abzar sector bases, Torthakarf said. He thought for a moment. Maybe this is all for the best after all if it distracts the organization's attention. I wish we could make a boomerang ball reconnaissance, Ranthar Jard was saying, watching one of the view screens, in which a film, taken from an airboat transposed to an adjoining Abzar sector timeline, was being shown. The boat had circled over the Ganges, a mere trickle between wide, deeply cut banks, and was crossing a gullied plain, sparsely grown with thornbrush. The base ought to be about there, but we have no idea what sort of changes this gang has made. Well, we couldn't. We didn't dare take the chance of it being spotted. This has to be a complete surprise. It'll be about like the other place, the one the slaves described. There won't be any permanent buildings. This operation only started a few months ago with the Krautha invasion. It may go on for four or five months, so the Krautha have all their surplus captives sold off. That country, he added, gesturing at the screen, will be flooded out when the rains come. See how it suffered from flood erosion? There won't be a thing there that can't be knocked down and transposed out in a day or so. I wish you'd let me go along, Ranthar Jard worried. We can't do that either, Val said. Somebody's got to be in charge here and you know your own people better than I do. Beside, this won't be the last operation like this. Next time I'll have to stay on police terminal and command from a desk. I want first-hand experience with the out-time end of the job, and this is the only way I can get it. He watched the four police girls who were working at the big terrain board showing the area of the police terminal timeline around them. They had covered the miniature buildings and platforms and towers with a fine mesh at a scale equivalent of fifty feet. Each intersection marked the location of a three-foot conveyor ball, loaded with a sleep gas bomb and rigged with an automatic detonator which would explode it and release the gas as soon as it rematerialized on the Abzar sector. Higher, on stiff wires that raised them to what represented three thousand feet, were the disks that stood for ten hundred-foot conveyors. They would carry squads of paratime police in air cars and thirty-foot airboats. There was a ring of big two-hundred-foot conveyors a mile out. They would carry the armor and the airborne infantry, and the little two-man scooters of the air cavalry, from the service and industrial sectors. Directly over the spatial equivalent of the Kolgar sector wizard traders' conveyors was the single disc of Verkenval's command conveyor at a represented five thousand feet, 
and in a half-mile circle around it were the five new service conveyors. "'Where's the ship conveyor?' he asked. "'Actually, it's on Antigrav about five miles north of here,' one of the girls said. "'Representationally about where Sub-Chief Ranthar is standing.' Another girl added a few more bits to the network that represented the sleep gas bombs and stepped back, taking off her earphones. "'Everything's in place now, Assistant Verkin,' she told him. "'Good. I'm going aboard now,' he said. "'You can have it, Jard.' He shook hands with Ranthar Jard, who moved to the switch which would activate all the conveyors simultaneously, and accepted the good wishes of the girls at the terrain board. Then he walked to the mesh-covered dome of the hundred-foot conveyor, with the five new service conveyors surrounding it, in as regular a circle as the buildings and towers of the regular conveyor heads would permit. The members of his own detail, smoking and chatting outside, saw him and started moving inside. So did the newspeople. A public address speaker began yelping, in a hundred voices all over the area warning those who were going with the conveyors to get aboard. He went in through a door between two air cars and on to the central control desks, going up to a visa screen over which somebody had crayoned Novalan EQ. It gave him a view, over the shoulder of a man in the uniform of a field agent third class, of the interior of a conveyor like his own. End of Part 10